All right. How are you today, Gord? I'm good. <laughs> nice to see Glad you. Here. Yeah, you too. I don't think we've talked since March 10th. That's right. Yeah. So we've got some people signing in right now for our Critical Canadian Home Building Science Provincial Series Part 1. So make sure you've logged into the right webinar today. Uh, we'll get started in a little bit once we get some more people uh, joining us. I'm looking to see if I recognize any names here, Gord. I can't see the names myself. No. Um, there's panelists and there's attendees. And if you click on either one of those, it'll tell you who the panelists yeah, no. are and who the attendees are. Oh, oh I see. Armando. Armando, nice to see your name, buddy. Oh, I see Jeremy. Hello, Jeremy. So if anyone wants to say hi to anyone else they see on that attendees list, you can go to the chat feature down below and type in hi. And you can pick a certain person and you can say hi to hosts and panelists or everyone or pick a specific person you would like to say hi to. I'll say hi to Hector too. <laughs> down east. Nice to see you, Hector. No, oh, he's probably got nice weather there. <laughs> okay. I know Armando's Armando's got more nicer weather than us. He's from uh, Texas. If I got <laughs> right, Armando. Well, we have we have spring showers. <laughs> well, I recognize some familiar names from the last provincial one. That's great. That means we're gonna have some really good Q and A. That's I feel what I it. Hope. I feel it. <laughs> So today we're talking about indoor air quality and uh, our speaker is Gord Cook from Building Knowledge. We're just waiting uh, just a few more minutes and then we're going to get started. And we have 162 people signed up today, Gord. Wow. I always imagine, you know, normally when you go to an in-person meeting, yeah. people come in, they grab a coffee, there's supposed to be cookies there for me, they're not out, <laughs> but there's supposed to be cookies there. So by the time you get seated, get started, it's about, you know, five minutes after anyway. So I'm okay with yeah, five that's minutes, true. you know, three <laughs> to five minutes, I think we can give people. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, the session is recorded. So anyone who does show up here uh, a little past the hour will still be able to get the full recording of our witty banter. And uh, whatever Gord's got going on here is a, an hour and a half packed uh, full of knowledge. So it's going to be a, a good session today. Well, that's all. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, Gord, if you're ready, I think. Uh, yeah, we're well. It's only 101. Let's let's make oh, one. Is that what you've got? Uh, I've got 105 on my phone. I've got 103 on my wall clock, and <laughs> you never really know. Phone. I'm surprised what? your phone isn't dead nuts accurate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if you want to get started, we could do that. Yeah. Well, someone says they're going to make sure you have cookies when you come out later this month to chat them. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Nick. Hi, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Nick. <laughs> That's good. That's my old stomping ground. I'm from Blenheim originally. Really? That's yes. Cool. <laughs> we need lots of help down there. <laughs> So welcome everyone. We are here with Gord Cook today from Building Knowledge and uh, a big shout out to Enbridge Gas for sponsoring our provincial series here that you are attending today. This is a uh, critical Canadian home building science part one indoor air quality details for your high performance homes. And uh, so we're going to go over just a few housekeeping rules and uh, I don't think I need to introduce Gord. Everyone knows who Gord is. Um, I don't believe, um, if you want to switch to the next slide, Gord. Oh, sorry. We, uh, we're just showing you what that looks like from the provincial series. And if you go online, you can uh, sign up for the other parts that we have. There's uh, seven that we've got uh, on, on the record right now to have as part of the critical Canadian home building science. And then next slide, Gord. Uh, just a big shout out to Susan Cudahy, uh, who, 
sorry, cut a heat. And she's from Embers Gas. She's a supervisor, strategic builder relationship um, uh, person there. And she has uh, been working behind the scenes with her team to bring us all of these sessions. So thank you to Susan. And I don't know if she's joined us here today, but if she comes on, we'll, we'll be sure to have her join us. And I, I always think it's cool, Stacey, you and I've worked with Enbridge for years. So they've always been great partners to the industry, right? Always helping along the path, uh, the legacy company at Union, but then Enbridge as well with uh, their savings by design just helping builders move along the path of, I'll call it the path of continued improvement to, to higher performance. And, and as we near net zero, uh, they've been really supportive of all, all of that. And always from a science base, we always really appreciate uh, Enrich sponsorship. I, I enjoy working uh, with those folks. Yeah, I've, I've learned a lot from these sessions, Gord, for sure. Um, just uh, if anyone who's new to Zoom, if you scroll down to your bottom taskbar there, it lets you know where you can put a question in uh, for Gord. And that's where the questions actually get recorded and we can see them better from our admin side. And then they get answered and saved as part of the webinar. If you just want to do a shout out or ask a general admin question, uh, like something's not going right with your computer, getting the information or copying the links that we will put in there, then put that in the chat, okay? Otherwise, um, everyone else is muted uh, other than Gordon and myself, and uh, there's no way for you to come on online to be seen or heard. So just uh, even if you raise your hand, I can, I can see it, but I can't let you speak because that's the way the settings have been set up. And then we really appreciate it afterwards. Uh, once the recorded uh, session is done, you're going to be asked to fill out a Survey Monkey uh, survey. And we really ask that you fill that out as soon as you can. It's about three minutes, and it just helps us to build the content that works well for what you guys actually need. Okay. And everything plus a little bit extra with the resource email will be sent to you after the webinar. And so that's the basic format with the agenda. Um, we don't have any special guests today. It's all just Gord today. And uh, we'll try to keep, keep up with your questions as they come up and get to them uh, in a timely manner. And I think with that, we're gonna start a poll. We're gonna first start off with where you are located and you'll see a pop-up and just pick where you're coming from today and listening to our webinar. Let's see. Uh... Is that that's what we expected mostly everyone's coming from Ontario I'll just let you see it in a second here Gord a few more people got 75 percent answering all right I'm going to close it in five four three two one okay all right so Gord if you can see yep I see the other, that's, there's a Mondo down in other under USA. So <laughs> thank you, buddy. No one's coming from Europe yet, so I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> no one's on vacation there. All right. And then uh, a second poll that we're going to just run really quickly here is, what do you do? Are you a builder? Are you a renovator? Are you one of the industry members um, from CHBA or Enbridge? Um, just let us know where, where you work. What gets you up in the morning? Just let a few more come in there. Mostly builder renovators are coming in, energy evaluators. You know, there's a lot more energy evaluators out there than I than I thought, Gord. I didn't That's think good. We, yeah, I didn't think we had so many uh, that have taken up that profession. Well, and it's, um, well, uh, two things. They've taken out the profession and they're committed to, uh, I would say, good education, building science. I always really appreciate, you know, we consider them colleagues of ours. But sometimes we're competitors in some cases, but for the most part, we're all just out there trying to help builders and homeowners make better decisions and indoor air quality is a big part of it. So that's what Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, we can only put 10 in a, a Zoom of what actual occupations we can choose from. So we're going to see a lot in the, the chat room there. I'm going to end the poll now. And we'll share those results. And then, uh, yes, we got about, nice. is that what you expected, Gord? Most of Builder or Renovator? Yeah. 
Very nice. Uh, nice to see a number of engineers there, my uh, compatriots on the engineering side. Thank you for that. Yeah. And then um, in the chat, we've got manufacturer and our, uh, the architect. Yep. Uh, real estate investors, architectural tech and design. Well, that's a good one. Very cool. Uh, I hear the gourd is special. Okay. All right. <laughs> 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 all right. So that's that. Um, Thank you for, uh, for that. That's great. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, so that's it for the polls today. And then uh, just a reminder, um, if you are not on a list to get the information from Building Knowledge, if you uh, sign up for that, uh, we'll get the link in the chat room shortly. And uh, you can go and sign up to make sure you don't miss anything from uh, Building Knowledge. Thank you for that. All right. And with that, Gord, I'm going to leave you to it. Sure, um, and we'll want to chat just a little bit, uh, Stacy. But I'll sure. just remind you uh, these this uh, uh, schedule from Enbridge Gas, their Advanced Building Science webinar schedule is posted. So visit uh, uh, again our website under events, and uh, a couple of uh, a session, a new session session uh, in 2022 is construction heat and appliance commissioning that's being held in on May 12th. And then we have a really interesting session on carbon reduction strategies for new Canadian homes. This is the, the new metric. I, I started my career in the energy world back in the 80s, and now we're transitioning fairly quickly to the carbon world. So uh, it has to be on everybody's agenda to kind of sort through that. It's the, I would say, relatively early days. Chris Magwood, one of our speakers, wouldn't necessarily agree with that. He would say it's uh, we're past, well past uh, early days. But uh, come learn on May 19th about the uh, uh, carbon reduction strategies for new Canadian homes. But this particular session, I'm, I'm interested, I'm intrigued to have the opportunity. I've been teaching actually a lot of IEQ sessions of late. I noticed some folks on the call were, were actually on an inner quality webinar, a longer uh, series. It was a two-part series uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, they're going to see some similarities here because this is a sort of a summary of that session. But it, it is of interest to a lot of folks. In fact, Stacey, you were saying it's of interest to you and your own, your own house. Give us your experience with uh, indoor air quality. Yeah, so I, I just finished my home inspection uh, program certification and just learning that like even the trades are, are learning stuff as, as it gets thrown at them. And I had um, a couple of people from your staff, Angela and Rob, come out because something didn't seem right in my house. You know, it's... Uh, 16 year old house just felt like something wasn't right with you know the dust accumulation allergies that were happening with the family members and so they came in and said well your hrv ductwork is in backwards it's the top should be on the bottom and for 10 years it had stayed like that wow. and just one little switch like that and then uh, putting in a few dampers to help get rid of the radon issue that had accumulated as well and just two quick little fixes like that, you know, and we're, we're up and running a little better. And so you don't know when you have a problem until health issues start happening, but it'd be nice to nip it in the bud a little sooner, right? <laughs> exactly. And I like the way you said it though. I knew something what, what uh, quite wasn't right. What wasn't quite right. That's an interesting phrase because it's very common in my world too. When people think about indoor air quality, they haven't necessarily thought they, they don't exactly know how to describe it. Um, I always like to say we, we have the capability, our noses have the capability of, of uh, detecting over a million different odors, but we only have names for about a couple of dozen of them, you know, rosy smelling, lavender fresh, various words like that, musty. But we, we really run out of descriptors and we're not, our bodies aren't necessarily in tune and, and or at least our mind isn't necessarily in tune with our body. So it's a very common thing for us to hear. Something doesn't quite feel right in my house. I'm not sure what it is. Could you come out? What's interesting to me is they're always looking for the one thing. What's the one thing in my house that may have changed? And it's seldom one thing. In your case, nicely, it, uh, you had a couple of things to... Uh, that to resolve it your ventilation was installed incorrectly but what of course in this session we're primarily focusing on on new housing and in high performance homes and the kinds of things that that we can think of uh, but we should also think about existing homes and i'll give you a little sense of that as we go through the day as well so i will talk fairly quickly because this is a bit of a summary and some of this is um, I, I'm going to say by, by default is old information because frankly, we know the science around this. 
But let's see how we do, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. Stacy, if there's a burning question along the way, you'll know to interrupt me. I've, uh, that That's totally fine as we no move. No worries. Through. Awesome. Thanks, Dorothy. Thank you. And so uh, we'll do just a little quick refresher of the issue, the history, and the opportunities. A little bit about the definitions around indoor air quality versus in, indoor environmental quality versus wellness, um, and and good indoor air versus outdoor air. What that means. Uh, we'll talk about some of the strategies for the healthiest possible air in homes. Some of the key pollutants. We need to talk about humidity a little bit, and then solutions uh, for improving air quality and a couple of really interesting programs to uh, that could help highlight this for you from a I'll say from a marketing perspective that would support any of the efforts you're making with respect to indoor air quality. And I, I, I do want to go back and remind you that Canadian building science, that is the study of air, heat, and moisture flow, energy flow in houses, started in the early 70s, 1970, the oil embargoes and so on that started us there. But in fact, our, our research on indoor air quality also dates back 30 to 40 years. As early as 1988, Health, Health Canada undertook a very comprehensive study of 18,000 in uh, children in 20 different communities. I see I've got a bit of a typo there, 20 different communities. They did a, a very significant study in Wallaceburg in 1993 that was kind of the definitive study on uh, ventilation, air leakage, and so on. And then they had ongoing basement study. They have a, a, a pilot, a, an asthma study that's still on, ongoing, actually, from the year 2000, where they're following children. They followed children since, uh, well, since early 2000s. They've been following kids and now they're into their teens and watching the interaction between their house um, and their health. So we, we come in the same way that from an energy perspective, Canadians have done a nice job. We, we would say we've done a, a great job from a health perspective or at least indoor air quality perspective. So much of what you're going to see is based on this, this uh, well-grounded, well-founded uh, information and you're going to find it's very consistent with EPA's work in the United States, the Environmental Protection Agency. So keep that in mind as we move through this. And here's some of the key findings, and you'll hear these phrases a lot. You'll hear that phrase, indoor air is two to five times worse than outdoor air. That was an EPA statement uh, 30 years ago. I asked them recently if that's still true. I, I validated with them that, that they still consider this to be true. This is a phrase that I would say used and sometimes misused. Uh, everybody from carpet manufacturers to Febreze and uh, I, I would say filter ma manufacturers use this phrase. And they sometimes, I would say, misquote it a little bit. That uh, And so we need to explain it just a little bit more. That Wallaceburg study found that uh, mold growth in houses was the result of primarily of bulk moisture. It wasn't a relative humidity issue in houses. It was about bulk water, that is water leaks. Uh, the immune system of children living in moldy houses is affected. They made the link between mold and immune systems of children, which is pretty interesting. And here's an interesting one. More mold is found in older homes and leakier houses, leaky houses have more mold than tight houses. This idea that we um, often hear, well, these new houses, they build them too tight these days, there's going to be problems with moisture, moisture and mold actually wasn't true, wasn't found to be true. Not to say that new houses with water leak problems couldn't have issues, but it really was more about water leaks than it was relative many or air tightness of buildings. Airtight buildings aren't necessarily a problem. They're not the problem we sometimes think they are. And dampness and molds increase respiratory problems and affect immune systems. And no surprise, the last one, and the one that we need to be respectful of, the young, the old, and the sick are at greatest risk. It's not fair of us, uh, I'll, I was going to call myself generously middle, middle age, but it's not fair of us to walk into a home and say, everything feels good to me, when in fact it might be uh, the, the young or the elders or the sick that are in the house that are, are affected. So just because you personally aren't affected by indoor air quality doesn't mean your clients are. We, we need to be very conscious of that, that health is a very personal thing. And what's affecting us may not be affecting others and vice versa. So please be respectful of that as we move through. So just a little bit on IEQ versus IEQ versus the term wellness. I'll, I'll mention wellness now as sort of a, a new movement, and it's defined as an active pursuit of a healthier lifestyle, active pursuit, which it, it's not a passive thing. It's not, well, uh, the builder better do something about the air quality in my house. No, it's about people taking on an active role of staying healthy, uh, of, sorry, of, of uh, fitness, um, 
choices with respect to food, with respect to water, choices with respect to how they maintain their house. That's the concept of wellness. It, it falls into, of course, it, it certainly um, impacts our understanding of indoor environmental quality versus indoor air quality as well. But just to look at those terms, my world is primarily indoor air quality, which is things like relative humidity, carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, radon molds, volatile organics, particulates, and surface mold, surface moisture, whereas IEQ would expand out and say, but we also need to think about temperature and mean radiant temperatures, our sense of comfort against, say, a big piece of glass, our, our, our body radiating heat to a cold piece of glass. That would be IEQ, and it would be things like circulation rates and drafts, it would things sound and light, electromagnetic forces. It's a little more all-encompassing. What we do need to know is this, about 60% of indoor air quality complaints are actually temperature and humidity complaints. So it is, in fact, IEQ and IAQ are linked, and we need to be respectful of the fact that first and foremost, we have to get the air temperature right, we have to get the relative humidity right, and then we can start thinking about indoor air quality overall in terms of pollutants and so on. So we need to think about that. One of the things that we always talk about is, what exactly is good indoor air? How would you describe it? And here's a, a maybe controversial, not so much anymore, but is, is as fresh and as clean as outdoor air. And immediately you've got people, well, wait, wait a minute, is the outdoor air actually any good? Well, I can guarantee you this, indoor air is always worse than outdoor air. Well, well, how can you say that? Well, where did the air that's currently in your home come from? Well, well, it came from outside. And then you cooked in it, lived in it, showered in it, had the pets in there, you put the scented candles, you added other chemicals to mask odors. Generally speaking, except for a few days a year or a few events like wood smoke, wildfires, and so on from BC and came across the states from California, in general, indoor air is worse than outdoor air. That's why that EPA phrase, the two to five times worse. But there, the second phrase is an interesting one, has no odors. It turns out we have this amazing instrument called our nose, and our nose is more sensitive than most of the equipment you can buy. You can buy tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment that aren't nearly as sensitive as the average human nose. The problem is our nose is connected to a very lazy brain. In fact, so I was watching some uh, a documentary on recent research. They actually have uh, pretty much uh, figured out that the human nose, the olfactory senses in the nose, in a human nose, are about the same is, as in a dog's nose. We always think dogs have great noses. The difference is the brain center that trans, uh, translates those, those signals from the, from the, uh, from the nose are in a, in a dog's brain uh, are actually a bigger center of the brain. That is, the dog's brain knows more about and knows how to interpret smells than the human brain. The human brain is, is very primitive in terms of its ability to interpret what an odor might mean um, and to, uh, to react to it. So I thought that was kind of interesting research that would say we have the ability to, to detect odors and pollutants. We just don't necessarily know what to do with that. And hence, uh, Stacy's element of something doesn't quite feel right, but I, I just don't know what it is exactly. That could be her, her nose detecting something, but the brain not necessarily being able to translate it into, into action. And then simple phrases like has fewer uh, uh, pollutants, healthier to breathe, and I already mentioned um, it has the right temperature and humidity. So keep those words in mind as we move through at this particular uh, uh, session to say as fresh and as clean as outdoors, no odors, and as few pollutants um, as possible as useful. And this is a, an older slide for sure. I just updated on the right-hand side. Because of COVID, um, in, the, in this last year, over $2 billion worth of devices that we would say are air quality uh, uh, driven. That is uh, uh, portable room HEPA filters, uh, filters for furnaces, uh, air cleaners, um, deodorizers, ionizers, those kinds of things. So it's a big market. People are already spending money on this. Uh, I will have builders say to me, you know, people aren't interested in paying for this. Uh, they'd want me to put it in for free. Well, clearly they are interested in paying for this. We just need to help them understand that it's not a $1.98 solution, a plug-in fresh air freshener. It's perhaps a four or five thousand uh, dollar issue that we need to manage and help with. Um, in the middle, you would uh, obviously recognize that uh, poor indoor air quality affects uh, uh, the productivity, and no, no, uh, 
a better example than, of course, during COVID. And Stacy, is there a question? Well, I'm just wanting to remind everyone that, that if they have a, a really good question, I want them to put it in the Q&A section. Uh, not the chat. Yes, there are two questions. So if you've got a second uh, sure. to listen. Um, so Norman is asking, what's your opinion on regular duct cleaning? EPA says routine duct cleaning is not necessary, but only as needed. And also because duct cleaning disrupts settled dust inside the ducts. You've got but the duct exactly cleaning right. industry recommends every three years and yearly if they have pets. What are your thoughts? And my, my thoughts are entirely in keeping with EPA and CMHC, which would say after a major event such as uh, you know a, a renovation and so on, maybe every seven years, um, and of course done properly with with uh, good quality to make sure we're not disturbing the dust and recognizing for the first few days after duct cleaning the air quality actually does get worse because you've unsettled dust. So uh, that uh, the, I would take the advice and lots of work's been done on that to say new construction after a major renovation or some event. If you're moving into a house that you're not familiar with, fair enough. But then at most every seven years or only if you recognize an issue. So hopefully that helps that one. Yeah. And then I don't know if the rules have changed, but uh, uh, Namish is asking what's a good temperature and humidity in a home? We'll come to that one. That's yeah. a great one. So thank you for putting that in and yeah. we'll chat about that. The one on the left hand side, I would just ask you to think about your own family. Anybody in your immediate family, brother, sister, mother, father, son, daughter with asthma, allergies, respiratory problems. If you ask your clients that, you will find 30% of the time they will say yes. And almost immediately they'll say, why, have you got something? So add it to your list. If you're a builder, if you're a mechanical contractor, if you're an energy advisor working in somebody's home, simply say to them, as I'm doing this work, it's not the first question you ask, should be, I be aware of anybody in the household that has asthma, allergies, or respiratory problems? I think I can help with that. Hopefully we can help with that. And we, then the big question is, why is this a bigger issue than ever? And some would say on the left-hand side, it's because we build houses tighter. Well, it's a minor piece of the puzzle, I would say. But what we also need to remind ourselves is we're using different building materials, more chemicals, more off-gassing. Um, and in fact, air conditioning is an interesting one. And you say, well, we've been doing air conditioning a long time. Actually, not that long, only 30 to 40 years. And because we've only been air conditioning 30 to 40 years, that meant we used to have our windows open all summer long, and now we don't. And so air conditioning means it's not the air conditioning that causes the problem. It's the fact that we don't open our windows, which is in the middle slide there, the middle picture. One of the biggest reasons that we have air quality problems is we've stopped opening windows. And by the way, we're spending more time indoors. And especially during COVID, boy, not only are, is, are we living in our house uh, more often just as, as uh, occupying as a house, but now it's our home office. Now it's our, now it's our school. Now it's our recreation center. So we have more and more interest in, in our houses uh, and the way they work throughout the day. And we're using houses for different purposes. And on the right-hand side, we have, I think you would all agree, we always like you to do this. This minute you get off this call today or when you get home, I want you to open up the critical cupboards underneath the sink in the kitchen, underneath the sink in the bathroom, in the medical cabinet, perhaps in the walking in the uh, pantry. And I want you to count and inventory the number of bottles of chemicals of stuff. And you'll find it's always in the order of about 100. And you need to ask yourself, what's in that stuff? Uh, many cleaning products, for example, have benzene, toluene, naphthas. Uh, most of the uh, indoor uh, air uh, 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 air fresheners and so on actually have naphtha in them. And what naphtha does is actually dulls your senses. It it actually it's it's encouraging your nose to say, "Nah, I'm not I'm not going to actually notice that." It, it, so it's actually dull, but it's also known as as a, a nerve disturber. So we have to be really careful about the chemicals we're using in our houses. These are the reasons why it's a bigger issue than ever. And if I summarize that, more appliances, more hot water, more pets. I'm not against cats. Just let's understand: cats need three times the amount of ventilation that humans do. When I do uh, indoor air quality work in kennels, in uh, SPCAs, the Humane Society, we count cats at 35 to 40 CFM, 40 CFM per cat. Humans are 15 CFM. 
Dogs are 20 to 25. They give off more stuff. They're actually more sensitive. More pets means that we need more ventilation and, of course, more stuff in our houses than ever before. And other changes. I mentioned we have more windows, but we open them less. Windows used to be the way we ventilated houses. Keep that in mind. More insulation in our buildings means we have less drying potential in our walls, in our attics. So we have more risk of mold. More insulation means we have to do a better job of manning moisture in houses as a result. And in general, we have more wetting potential in houses than ever before. Notice that bottom left picture. They're watering the house. Within 20 minutes, the water's getting into the unit below. This is uh, stacked townhouses. And so we have a different water management principles, and we have more sensitive materials than ever before. So we have greater potential for moisture problems in houses. And yes, we're making them more airtight, which actually is a good thing, as we'll chat about in a bit. But more airtight is, is, has an implication on air quality. And we're making them more airtight, and yet we're putting in more exhaust appliances. Why? Because apparently everybody's become a gourmet chef, and everybody wants the gas range. And there's a lot of pollutants off of any range, not just gas range. Ranges, but there's a lot of uh, pollutants, a lot of aerosols coming off of the uh, gas ranges, cooked oils and so on, that are known triggers from an air quality perspective. So keeping that in mind. I do want to go back to this idea, though, of outdoor air. And one of the things we absolutely need to be respectful of, and it's a great news story, specifically in North America, but in other places in the world as well. 1968, that's what the average city in the United States looked like, about 100 days a year, maybe not 100, 60 to 100 days a year. And the Clean Air Act of 1970s by EPA and signed on to by Canada did an amazing job of cleaning up air by about 80% in urban centers. It's one of the reasons we can now say outdoor air is better than indoor air. But when we look at outdoor air and think about what we're, what's in that air, it's two main things that we're worried about. It's ozone, O3, a highly reactive uh, uh, compound that immediately wants to oxidize. That is, it means it wants to take one of its oxygen atoms and stick to something else, oxidize. Another word for rust or corrode. Ozone is bad for our lungs. The good news is, as it comes through our building enclosure or through a, a ventilation system, it dissipates really quickly. But that's damaging outside. And when you hear people say, uh, 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 authorities say, those with uh, respiratory problems should stay indoors today, it's because of high ozone levels. And the good news is, even if I bring in fresh air from outside, that ozone is actually dissipated really quickly and it's not a dangerous to us inside. As long as we're not intentionally creating ozone in houses, which we've not done in Canada for years, so thank you to CMHC and Health Canada for discouraging people putting in ozone generating machines. The, the one that I want to touch on just quickly is fine dust. Fine dust, and, and it's called PM 2.5. I'll speak about it here for a couple of slides. Particle matter smaller than 2.5 microns in size. And for comparison, the average human hair, the width of a human hair is around 40 to 60 microns. So we're talking about 2.5, about one, what's that, about one tenth the size, maybe one, uh, one twentieth the size of the diameter of human hair. These are particulates that make their way deep into the lungs, and that's why they're so uh, damaging. And for the most part, they are generated outside. Uh, you'll see in a second, vehicle exhaust and so on. So that's what we, sorry, that's what we want to think about, a uh, fine uh, particle dust outside. Um, and then when we think about pollutants, we think about building-related pollutants and occupant-related. And you can imagine in today's session, I really want to focus on building-related. I don't want you saying to homeowners, it's your fault. I want, to, want you to say to them, we've done the best we can. Here's things that we've done. And then, of course, there are pollutants that you're responsible for, and we've given you measures to help control those. So be mindful of that. So one, we're going to reduce pollutants related to the building, and two, we're going to give occupants strategies to be able to manage their pollutants a as well. And when we think about those po potential pollutant sources, I won't leave it on the screen for a second, but in terms of building related, the off-gassing from paints and building materials, moisture and mold, construction dust, 
radon is building, even though you can't do anything uh, to uh, get rid of radon, radon is uh, part of the, the uh, building-related elements. On the people-related side, cleaners, personal hygiene products, furniture, people's pets, so on and so on. Um, and then, of course, down in the bottom corner left, you would say some of these are both people and building, things like garage pollutants, pest and pesticides. So these are all pollutants that we would say, can we do anything about those? And the first one on the list on top left, off-gassing, paints and building materials. Hmm, we've already done a great job on those. Let's make sure we highlight that. And in fact, when we think about the leading or most important pollutant sources, we would think about lead and asbestos, right? That's, we've known about that for a long time. And the good news is, at least in new housing, we fix that. In existing housing, if you're doing renovation, you need to be careful about disturbing those. But isn't it nice to know, and you could say to your clients, been there, done that, checkbox, you don't need to worry about lead or asbestos in our house. The house you're coming out of may have had asbestos in the duct linings and so on, but at least in new houses were much safer. The second one is, and very important of course, is carbon monoxide. But again, certainly in Ontario and most parts of Canada, uh, and many parts of the U.S., we've kind of solved this one, right? We went to direct vent sealed combustion equipment, and for the most part, unless there's an equipment failure or unless you have an open hearth chimney in a house, we've, we've managed, done a really nice job, and we should take credit for that as a building industry, that new houses are indeed safer for the, for, than old houses because of technology such as high efficiency direct vent sealed combustion furnaces, water heaters, fireplaces, we're in much better shape. Now we're down the list, though, of other elements, things like radon and particle matter 2.5, I mentioned that earlier, mold, material off-gassing to some extent. And, and I would say I give material off-gassing, well, it's sort of a, a, a lighter shade of green. We've done a good job of reducing paints, low VOC paints and finishes, but we also probably need to think about adhesives and other elements that we're going to put into into our building materials. So we're going to ask you to make better choices. So those are some of the pollutant sources. And again, I'll mention this small particulates, and I wanted to show you the sources. Smoke from fires and wood smoke. Vehicle exhaust is one of the biggest uh, generators of, of fine dust particles. Industrial uh, work. And then in, in houses, cooking, and to a lesser extent, pets. Some of the pets, certainly cat dander is very, very fine will make its way deep into the lungs. It's a bit of an issue that way, at least some of the cat dander. But for the most part, this is generated outside, and our job is to keep it from coming in, and if it does come in, filter it out. So keep that in mind as we move through this session. And in terms of what we're able to measure, this is pretty fascinating. Back in the day, in the early days, we really struggled to measure things like carbon dioxide, and radon was difficult to measure, at least on a short-term basis. We could measure it long-term, but finding a short-term measure was difficult. Of course, we're able to measure temperature and relative humidity. Carbon monoxide is relatively easy to measure. What's, what's uh, more interesting to us are these other elements, VOCs and PF2.5. 2, we didn't used to really have reliable ways of measuring these or deciding what was the right amount or how much was too much. And now we have much better equipment to measure that are stay in calibration longer, less expensive, more cost effective, and also methods to be able to say, how are we going to control these or make sure that they're not um, going to be an issue in our houses. So pretty powerful when we think of it that way. And you do need to be conscious of the fact that your clients probably uh, or may well be buying some of these. These are all available online. Uh, these devices have done a nice job in the way they calibrate. Most of these are looking at not the absolute amount of a pollutant, but the change in pollutant levels. That's very interesting and very powerful. So it takes a baseline reading over a short period of time and then says, boy, I just saw a change in your VOC. Something must have happened. I better give you an alarm. It may not be the actual level of VOCs that's the problem. It's the fact that it changed in magnitude that is the issue. So you're going to be responding to these, and I'm going to say be proactive rather than having them put them in. What you may want to do is start looking at some of the major manufacturers of ventilation equipment, Panasonic, and they've partnered with Swidget on the left-hand side, and they have air quality sensors that can go into plugs in rooms that could then help you control your ventilation system, for example. 
On the right-hand side, the same thing. Brown Newton has a system called Overture, which you can put sensors in various areas. I think I can play this one for you. So if you're in the kitchen, uh, there in the bathroom, humidity raise, ri levels rise, um, it will turn on your HRV, for example. It might turn on your bathroom fan in the kitchen. When you run the range hood, pollutants coming off, it'll turn on the range hood fan. Those kinds of uh, technologies are now available to us that weren't available uh, as recently as five years ago. So opportunities for us in houses to give uh, people a better sense of control uh, and concern about uh, pollutants that are happening in their housing. When we talk about indoor air quality, one of the most fascinating parts is every house you go into has a problem. We all have uh, chemicals underneath our sinks. We all have carpet fibers or pet fibers and uh, personal hygiene products. So we, w the question is, how much is too much? We, we, we don't want to flag ourselves over the back all the time saying, oh, we're doing nasty stuff. We have to build a house. There's going to be uh, uh, adhesives. There's going to be finishes in order to make them happen. The question is, how do we prioritize those indoor air quality pollutants? And first and foremost is the proximity to occupants. You can imagine a bedroom, the, the, the bedding that a child's sleeping on is way more important to us than, say, uh, the couch downstairs in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the great room or something like that. So it's the proximity. It's the toxicity of that pollutant. Just how noxious is it? How dangerous is that particular pollutant? Uh, the amount of that material, a large carpet area, for example, versus a small area rug. And the proximity to heat and moisture. Turns out in uh, in when subject to heat and moisture, things off tend to off gas more. Carpets off gas. That's why you wouldn't want to put, for example, carpets in kitchens anymore because that that it's uh, proximity to heat and moisture. It off gases more, captures more, and off gases more. And the example would be the flooring choices in an asthmatic child's bedroom, a much higher priority than say the paint choices in the kitchen. So helping our clients understand if in fact they have somebody in the household with asthma, allergy, respiratory problems, what could I do to create a really clean space for that particular person to uh, interact with? Because they're going to spend eight, 10 hours a day there. Uh, so let's chat about that. And in terms of, and this is the key slide, and most of you hopefully have seen this before, but you need to see it again and again because we need to be reminded that it's not about buying um, uh, air fresheners and it's not about killing molds. It's about first and foremost removing pollutants. Just making a choice not to have them in our houses at all. Take them out of our material list. Anything we often say it. If it's if it smells, it stinks. Use your nose from this day forward. Every builder, as you choose building materials, use your nose. And the less it smells, the better it is from an air quality perspective. Now, it's not that carbon monoxide is an example of you can't smell carbon monoxide, and it's very, very dangerous. But in general, mostly pollutants, the, the stronger they smell, the worse they are for air quality. And so it's about removing pollutants. Um, I often talk about, um, and you'll see on the slide here, if Johnny's allergic to the dog, get rid of, and almost every crowd will say, well, get rid of Johnny. Some will say the dog, some will get rid of Johnny. But the fact of the matter is, we, we can't even say that, can we? It's not fair of us as builders to say, I'm sorry, you can't have pets living indoors. We probably shouldn't have pets living indoors. We kind of learned during the bubonic plague that the chickens, the pigs, and horses should live in a separate building because they were transmitting the plague. So I'm not saying uh, Muffy or, or uh, Rocky here is uh, uh, creating huge toxins, but if children are allergic to dogs or cats, uh, then we should consider uh, uh, finding another loving home for that pet in the same way that building materials. Well, I love a, a particular sealant. I don't want to stop using it, but in fact, if it's uh, uh, highly toxic or toxic at all, then we should try to find other sources, remove. And if we can't remove, then we can seal or isolate. So if I said to you, Johnny's alert to the dog, where should the dog never be allowed to go? The dog shouldn't be allowed to go in the bedroom. And we would isolate or seal the bedroom so that we don't have pollutants moving from the house to the bedroom. We'd actually keep the bedroom under positive pressure highly filtered air, positive pressure. You can imagine what wouldn't be in Johnny's bedroom. Well, we wouldn't have carpets because the carpets would 
inevitably capture some of the pollutants from the, the dander, the dog that's in the air, and re-emit it later on. So seal or isolate. But from a builder's perspective, this is an important strategy as well. The house to garage connection. We would say don't have an attached garage. Well, that's impractical for many builders. The designers in this call would say <laughs> people want attached garage for safety, for convenience, and so on. Fair enough. So let's seal or isolate the house from the garage. That's why you do an air tightness test. You're going to, well, I, I thought I did air tightness because I got to do it for Energy Star. No, the single most important reason to do an air tightness test is to make sure there's the house to garage connection is, is uh, zero. That is that we are not communicating between the house and the garage. That's a life safety, health and well-being, as opposed to simply an energy thing. So air tightness testing, making houses tighter, is actually good from an air quality perspective. So if you can't find a way to remove it, isolate or seal. If you can't find, for example, low off-gassing uh, uh, particle boards or ca cabinets, then simply seal them. Ask for sealed edges. You can do this. I've done this. Yes, there's a premium charge, but it's going to become more normal if we said we're simply going to seal and encapsulate all the edges. It has lower off-gassing rates. These are, pra well, you may not say practical, but I'm going to say practical applications of seal strategies. Uh, third on the list is a ventilation, if diluting outside air, but more importantly, the second bullet there, point source removal. Understanding that we really do want point source removal at, at, over top of ranges and in bathrooms to take the high levels of moisture and pollutants immediately of the house rather than letting them diffuse through the house and then trying to recapture them through a dilution system. Fourth on the list is filtration. And I say that advisedly. These are in the order of priority. Remove, seal, ventilate, filter. If we had a test, perhaps we should, you would always want to put these in orders of magnitude. You will not filter your way out of a cat allergy. I'm not saying don't have cats. What I'm saying to you is don't rely simply on a filter if, if somebody uh, has a cat allergy. Think about uh, a remove strategy. Think about seal strategies. Think about ventilation strategies. Stacy, did I offend somebody? Which is <laughs> no, other than I don't want Rocky to be removed from the house. <laughs> exactly, which I'm good with. Yeah. Uh, but one of the questions that's come up in the chat was, uh, can you comment on electronic air cleaners, 20-year-old uh, units versus new units, if they're still sold and if there's replacement options? It's a great, it's a great question. I do have a, a number of slides on filtration coming Perfect. up. So if they can hold that one, that would be great. Thanks for letting me know. No, though. Notice what's not on this list, though. Tea tree oil, air fresheners, ionizers, bionizers, ozonators, uh, UVC lights, none of those are on this list. And this list is uh, it, very consistent with all of EPA's literature in the United States, CMHC's literature, Health Canada's literature. All the world leading authorities would say to you, concentrate on remove, seal, ventilate, and filter. That's an important strategy. And so I'm going to say to you, just in your own house, um, this comes from Dr. David Miller. Years ago, I was at a seminar. He was the preeminent authority on indoor air quality in Canadian houses. I've sort of lost track of where Dr. Miller is these days. But somebody said to him bluntly, so what would you do in your own house? First, clean your floors, which he said, hard surface flooring. In other words, no off-gassing, no particulates coming from the carpets. Second, ventilate at the source. Range hood, he mentioned range hood specifically, vented to the outdoors. The right amount, we would say, you don't need to overventilate, but ventilate the range, ventilate the bathroom. And third, manage humidity. Specifically, he said, in southern Ontario and in humid climates, dehumidify in the summertime to manage moisture. This was for your own home. If you're taking away and saying, I get home tonight, what should I do? Am I running my range? Am I running my bath fan? What are we doing at the floors? It did get asked, what if I do have carpets? No problem, he said. Here's all you need to do to keep carpets at the same level of air quality, if you will, air quality risk as hard surface flooring. Here's all you need to do. You need to buy a HEPA rated vacuum or a central vac vented directly to outside. And you need to vacuum every square meter for those in the, in the States, that's three square feet a square yard, if you will, every square meter of carpet twice a week for one minute. Every square meter, one minute, 
twice a week. Can you imagine doing that? They actually did this study. CMHC and Health Canada did this study in a household to determine whether they could, in fact, make carpets as good from an air quality perspective, as uh, uh, least risky as hard surface flooring. And it was a vacuum with a HEPA vacuum every square meter for one minute twice a week. It just uh, Hopefully it doesn't sound too ridiculous, but there you have it. But let's talk about radon. Radon's a really good example of, of a pollutant that we need to be conscious of. And it, in Canada, it still represents uh, 3,200 deaths a year. In the United States, 22,000 deaths a year. Here's where we can learn from our American friends because they've done an excellent job of radon. They've mapped effectively the entire country. It's well written into the building codes, well ingrained. They've been doing it for over 30 years in production housing, very cost effectively. We could learn from that. We should be designing in all housing Canada. We should be designing for the fact that I need to go to the map. We need to design to, to the fact that much of Ontario is in, and certainly in southern Ontario, is in a high risk zone. And even if you're not in a high risk zone, that you, it may be elevated, but you can find radon just about everywhere. And Canada in 2007 changed their rates from um, uh, 800 becquerels to 200 becquerels. For our, my American friends on this call, 200 becquerels is the same as four pico curies, which you guys have had as a limit since about the 1990s, right? Maybe even before. So we finally matched the Canadian, the U.S. rates, and now we should take radon as seriously as they do in the United States. And it turns out the strategy for solving that is a combination of seal and ventilate. Seal the slab where the radon could be coming from. That means poly, 10 mil poly or better, underneath the slab, sealed off, and then ventilated, a sub-slab ventilation. A fan or a duct that runs through the roof that positively or negatively pressurizes the slab. This is amazingly effective at managing both, both radon, in fact, moisture down in basements. So you seal the basement crack, seal the sumps, properly ventilate your house, of course, good perimeter drainage, poly and stone under the slabs, and then sub-slab depressurization. And the good news is, at time of new construction, this is relatively inexpensive. You know, it's in the matter of $1,000 as opposed to tens of thousands of dollars, and it's very difficult to do in existing houses. If you were to say to me, and you did at this session said, indoor air quality for high-performance houses, if you're a high-performance builder, the same things that you do for high-performance, like make houses airtight and insulate under slabs, you can modify ever so slightly by simply sealing. Owens oh, Corning has a radon-approved uh, 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 foam system, uh, or, or just a good moisture barrier, because Celadoric and various others have really good moisture slash radon barriers that go under slabs. For relatively very low dollars, as a high performance builder, you need to talk about radon. You've done a great seal, now just add a little bit of a ventilation element to it, and you've done radon. So hopefully that helps. Here's just a couple of examples. On the bottom right, you'll see the radon pipe going in. That's 20 feet of radon pipe. That's about all it takes. Imagine the cost. On the left-hand side, boy, you want to insulate your slabs anyway. Here's an insulation product that has a radon, uh, I'll call it collection system underneath it. Notice the pucks uh, on, under the foam that simultaneously gives you your ventilation uh, sorry, your uh, uh, radon collection and your insulation. The picture on the top right is what they're using in Edmonton now. These go together in a bit of an egg crate fashion, and you pour your slab on top of this, and so you have this vent space, and through the center hole of at least one of those, you, in fact, only one of those, you put your vent stack up. So these, these are being spread out across basement slabs, and they're actually able to get rid of their aggregate in this case because this goes on the scraped dirt and, and they don't need aggregate for moisture management because I have this airspace. So imagine thinking about replacing the aggregate with either on the left uh, the, the pucked foam or on the right this, uh, this uh, uh, standoff product that, that's being used. So fairly simple measures to get us to radon. And there's an example of that block just again. It's a product called Radon Guard. It's a pretty, pretty simple little product if, if you... Uh, if you understand. There's the liner going down. This happens to be a 15 mil liner, radon approved, proper tapes, proper sealants. Happens to be in my house, the uh, cottage that we built. And, and it does an excellent job, frankly, of managing moisture in basements as well. And there's the radon fan. This is Edmonton, Alberta. They're putting in an active radon system. 
There's the fan that's going in. They see it as part of their code requirement, large production builder in Edmonton, still selling houses, hasn't bankrupted anybody. You can do radon. If you ask me what should I be doing for air quality, radon's got to be on your list because the U.S. has done it. Canada's changed their standards. It's a concern, and it's definitive, and it can only be done at the time, practically, can only be done at the time of new construction. So let's get that done. Next on the list is, is mold. And when I say mold, understand that molds are everywhere. You'll never get rid of mold. There's mold spores in every space, every room, every inch, every cubic foot of air has mold spores in it around the world. So what we really want to think about is actively growing mold. You don't want to test for mold because you're going to find it. What you want to know, do I have actively growing mold? And the only re way that I'll have actively growing mold will, because I have be, it will be because I have moisture problems. In fact, moisture problems equaled mold problems. Mold is a symptom of moisture problems. If you find the moisture, you'll find mold. And if it's wet enough for long enough, typically 48 to 72 hours, you're going to start to see a high risk for mold. That just means we need to keep buildings dry. And frankly, that's the business you're in anyway, right? The whole building community is all about keeping the rain off people's heads. That's why we, so we're in business after all. So managing moisture is what we really want to do. It's about keeping surfaces dry, which means good drainage in basements, keeping materials dry during construction, water mounted foundations, walls and roofs, review plumbing and HVAC to avoid leaks, and if things get wet, get them dry really quickly. Venting and ventilation, dehumidification, that's what we need to think about in terms of moisture control. And I always need to spend just a few minutes on that moisture. You asked what's the healthy moisture level, relative humidity level, there it is. This is called the Sterling chart. It was developed in 1976, recently validated by ASHRAE. Notice that 40 to 60% is the healthy range to live in. The only problem we have with that in Canada is if you try to get to 40% in coldest winter days, you have liquid water, you have condensation on surfaces, unless you put in triple glaze windows. The reason you put in triple glaze windows is not to get you to HERS points or two gigajoule points. The reason you put in triple glaze windows for your clients from this day forward is to say to them so that you can keep your health house in the healthy relative midi range throughout the winter. Get that? That they may not want to spend $3,000 on triple glaze windows or four, whatever it happens to be, because it'll someday maybe save them some energy. What you really want to do is highlight to them that this is part of a healthy house. A healthy house has triple glaze windows in a cold climate, such that in southern climates, not a big deal, but in northern climates, such that I can maintain that healthy 40 to 60 percent. And it's the right moisture level is, in fact, 50 percent, plus or minus five in the summer and 35% uh, plus or minus five in the winter. We, we try to keep as close to 40 as we can. In cold climates, we can't get that high, so we keep it in that 35 to 40 range as much as possible. It's about maintaining a moisture balance. What's interesting is it's re remarkably difficult to find reliable moisture sensors. This is a, Ken Ruay reminded me from CMHC that he, he did this uh, little experiment. He went out and bought a bunch of sensors and monitors, put them in his office. In his office, it was 42% of relative humidity, but look at what the sensors are reading. So sometimes we have to remind clients that the relative humidity sensor that they're using may in fact not be particularly accurate. You'll even find thermostats the, the, the relative humidity sensor in a thermostat may not, in fact, be accurate enough. It's a good indicator of moisture, but it's absolutely possible that on the Nest, on the Ecobee, uh, or on the Venmar of A&E control, that the relative humidity that's on that control may be different than what you actually measure. Stacy, was there a question? Oh, you're on mute. There, there are a couple uh, questions sitting out here, but you just got me uh, thinking about the one that I have down here right now, yes. it's it's, cha it's changed by three degrees, and uh, <laughs> I find this one's very dummy proof because you can put it. Uh, it's got a magnet on the back, and you can, especially for my profession where I'm going into older homes that don't have the nice uh, humidity right. settings on the thermostats, right? So it, it lets them know whether it's low or too high. Yep. Um, so the questions came back from 
a couple of sessions back there, Gord. Um, as uh, an HVAC contractor, what would measure what measuring equipment would you suggest? So that was going back to before the, the mold discussion. And I'm not sure if you, uh, Namish, was referring to when you were talking about radon. So you uh, radon, I wouldn't recommend you necessarily need to buy a radon monitor. That's something you should recommend that every homeowner do. But I would have them go and buy a radon test kit, leave it in their house. The danger of measuring radon instantaneously uh, is that it, you really do need to take a long-term average. It can literally change by double, triple, quadruple on an hourly basis. My uh, partner Justin was just showing me his own and how it was changing just from uh, hour to hour, season to season, certainly. So what I would recommend for contractors would be good temperature and humidity, uh, good carbon monoxide, that, that's your business, good carbon dioxide, because that's an indicator of ventilation. Um, and then in today's world, you can find some reasonably cost-effective VOC monitors, but in general, to my mind, I would I would just build those into, say, a control strategy, such as I showed you the Panasonic or the Brone, and let homeowners monitor. Because, again, indoor air quality changes so quickly. If I take a VLC reading now, it may be different uh, an hour from now. So I'd rather leave that in as monitoring than uh, actually having a measurement device. So that's what I would leave with that. Okay. Uh, yep. So, Namish, if that wasn't exactly what you wanted answered, please uh, type that again in the question, okay? Um, do you have time for a few more? Uh, I, let's we... keep going. I'm just a little conscious yeah. of time and see if we can answer them as, as we finish. That's fine. Okay, perfect. Okay, yeah. so everyone just let, let them uh, know that. We'll answer those uh, as we can fit them in. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, and I just want to remind you, water is a really powerful force. This is a house that's less than eight years old. It's already rotted out. And it's not because there's foam insulation in the wall that's the problem, but the foam insulation or the amount of insulation actually changed the risk factors. This was a house that was built to look old, and some of the measures, me uh, methods that was used, you know, it was really w well built, other than the fact that when moisture got in, it had no way of getting out. And you'll notice the red tape around the windows that's actually not the way you install windows, right? Red tape is not designed as a, as a flashing detail. And the water was getting in around these windows and because there's no drying potential because we're highly insulated walls, this wall uh, started to rot out, rim joists and so on, the deck's gotta come off. Water can do damage in very short order. And insulation has changed the drying potential, which ups the risk. So I want to m remind all of you that I'll, while not all water leaks result in building failures, you need to be, as your insurance policy, you need to put an insurance blanket around your houses. You need to understand the principles of water management, of deflection of water. It'll be part of the building science series that we're doing, so I don't want to do too much on it today, but understanding the principles of deflection, the principles of drainage of water, the principles of drying characteristics of houses, and the principles of the durability of houses, making sure that we're managing water correctly, and counting the risk factors. Look at this, flat roof, slope roof into a parapet, so on and so on, four different cladding systems, uh, conditioned space over unconditioned space and uh, vice versa. Lots and lots of risk factors. And I won't play this one, I'll play this one. And, and this happens to be a, a, an animation that comes from construction instruction, my partners in the US. But if you were trying to install a window that would minimize the risk of water leak, the first thing you would do is slope the sill. In fact, you would do 10 different things to make sure that windows didn't leak. First would be to slope the sill. The second thing you would do is put on a properly uh, uh, install properly with button cap fasteners a water resistant barrier. I don't care the brand. Number three, you would properly cut out the window opening to keep the head clean and the sill clean and you would, uh, you would protect the jams with that water resistant barrier. Next on the list, you would fold this, uh, the uh, flashing, uh, sorry, the house wrap up such that you could shingle and lap the window. Next, you would fully flash the window sill to make sure that when water leaks, not if, when water leaks, it doesn't damage the sill. And then you would make sure on the list that you pressure rolled every piece of tape you put on a building. Then you would caulk three sides of the window, not the bottom, because if water does get in, we want to let it out. Then you would install the window with the proper side flashings and head flashings, not red tape, but actual flashing materials. And lastly, you would shingle and lap the 
water resistant barrier over top. Don't look at the brand name except this. Every water resistant barrier company uses exactly this same detail. If you look at their CCM uh, reports, they all use exactly this. Every window manufacturer uses this as their design, the way to properly install windows, and yet I don't see it done correctly. So if you're a high performance builder, I would say to you, start properly flashing your windows to make sure and uh, fully flash uh, water resistant barriers because you're a high performance builder, you go, well, that has nothing to do with indoor air quality. It has everything to do with indoor air quality. It's really important. And then think about basements and think about the dramatic challenges we have in living in holes in the ground. And we would say to you, stop digging holes in the ground. Of course, you're not going to, and that's fine, but understand the dramatic challenges there are in doing basements. So you need to improve the moisture control. You in need to insulate only after proper water management, grading early, insulating late, providing capillary breaks, and ultimately dehumidifying basements. All basements in Canada need a dehumidifier. That's not Gord Cook saying that. That's Health Canada and CMHC saying that. All basements in Canada need dehumidification. You could provide it to them as an air quality device. Put it in as part of your air quality package is to say, I've provided you with either whole house or basement dehumidification. And because we have these expectations for basements to be a lower living area, we want them to be warm, we want them to be dry, we want them to be bright, we want them to be healthy, we want them to be usable, and therefore we need to do a much better job of drainage, and most of you are doing a great job of drainage. Tell people about it, please, either on the left with draining uh, insulation layers or on the right, this is uh, uh, Dorkin's uh, uh, drainage layer. Tell your homeowners about this. This is a health device. This helps ensure that your basement does not have moisture problems. The most moisture prone area of your house is the basement. You need to do a better job of that. And then understanding that using fibers with vapor bears on the inside of buildings is not good from an air quality perspective. That is, basements need to dry to the inside. They're designed to dry to the inside. And unfortunately, our codes are just a little bit late in getting this changed. This wasn't a problem when we were doing R8 half height, R12 half height. But now that we're doing full height insulation, vapor bears on the inside, traditional vapor bears alone, are not the right idea. The one on the right is membrane, a certainty product that's a variable vapor barrier, if you will, that allows water, certain amounts of water vapor to dry through it so that it doesn't collect. But better, if I went to, a, this is Minnesota, look at the bottom. This is Association of uh, Minnesota Builders. In Minnesota, you are not allowed to insulate a basement on the inside in new construction unless you first insulate it on the outside. So imagine that, switching your insulation to the outside. Even if you don't do all of your insulation on the outside, using insulation on the outside before you insulate on the inside to keep that concrete warm. That's the way Minnesota's doing it. Let's learn from them to manage moisture inside of basements. And if you can't do that, then here's another great choice. What you'd really like to do is mitigate moisture problems by putting extruded polystyrene foams or spray foams, even EPS foams, direct on that concrete wall. This is showing spray foam in the rim. It doesn't have to be spray foam. It just needs to be incredibly airtight. And, and you will know that foam on the, on the wall needs to be protected. You say, well, I don't want to have to finish the basement. Well, nicely, Rockwell has created a detail where you can insulate the basement wall and not have to put up fire protection that is drywall. They have a detail that now allows that. In this case, we are going to show, show uh, blown-in insulation. It doesn't have to be blown in. And somebody would say, could I spray foam the whole thing? Sure, that's fine, as long as you then fire protect it. But in this case, showing uh, a, a blown-in insulation or sprayed-in insulation system uh, would, would help from a moisture perspective. And notice what's not going in. We're putting in drywall, but we're not putting in polyethylene. And you have the right, you have the ability in the current building code with a, a little bit of work, you have the right to be able to build a basement wall without poly as long as you have the right amount of foam insulation. And the magic of this wall is moisture coming from the outside to the inside hits that extruded polystyrene, which is only semi-permeable, and therefore stays in the concrete. And the concrete doesn't mind that. 
moisture coming from the other direction, which we've always been worried about, warm, moist air getting into that wall cavity, now rather than hitting cold concrete, hits the warm foam. And if the warm is the foam is warm enough, you will not get condensation in that wall. If you were to ask me, what should I do in a high performance house to, to offer indoor air quality, I would say more money on basements. Not necessarily more money, making sure you're doing your basements correctly to manage moisture. Don't just throw up an R22 bat and say, I'm done. That, that meets code, that meets energy requirements, but from a high performance indoor air quality, you would say, I need to tweak my basement system to offer better indoor air quality. Um, so there's a little example. And notice the bottom right is a dehumidifier. Get dehumidifiers into your houses is what we want to get to. Next, we have just have a, not too many minutes left, and I'll go fairly quickly. Uh, you know, you, most of you will know I have a ventilation background. That's where I come from. Remember, it was not first on the list. It wasn't second on the list. It was third on the list of things to do. And the good news is we're kind of doing it, and we've known it for a long time. This is off of Microfish. That's why it looks fuzzy. I thought it was pretty interesting. It was out of the New York Times in 1901 where Dr. Biggs, the eminent authority on tuberculosis, said, light and air is a means of preserving the health of occupants of tenements are just as necessary as running water. Imagine this, uh, folks were coming from Europe, from uh, uh, our ancestors, frankly, coming over from Europe, and they were all living in New York, at least, in the tenement buildings in the 1800s. And that was a time of open sewers and uh, 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 waterborne diseases, diphtheria, typhoid, typhus, uh, uh, sorry, ty yes, typhus, typhoid. And, and it was people were dying. And once they fixed the water problem, they realized people were still dying. But now they were dying of an airborne disease called tuberculosis. So in 1901, 1904 actually, they changed the building code to require windows on two different orientations. And there's the historic, they're, they're doing a remodel of these uh, apartment buildings in, in the US. And notice how the apartment buildings were designed back then in this jigsaw uh, puzzle kind of look to make sure there was windows on two different orientations. In fact, the, p the piece is we used to use our windows for ventilation. And in the 70s, we stopped using windows. Why? Because noise, dust, security, energy. And so we need to recognize that we need to have mechanical ventilation in all houses. Build it tight, for sure, to seal off from basements, to, sorry, to seal off from garages, to keep out the PM 2.5, and then ventilate. And that could be ventilate with windows, but frankly, if it's, you're worried about fine dust particles, you really want to ventilate with mechanical ventilation. And you want to bring fresh air in and filter it as you're bringing that air in. And the good news is it's been a code requirement since 1995. So in a, for a high performance house, all I want you to do is enhance the ventilation that's already code. You get to talk about it, but just enhance it. First of all, get the right amount. Understand, oops, sorry, get the right amount. Understand that it's based on occupancy loads in buildings. Building code does a nice job. Just make sure you have the right amount, the capacity for the right amount of ventilation. In a four bedroom house, need 75 CFM of ventilation. Then understand that I need source control on the top, at, that I have either a continuous running fan in the kitchen or an intermittent fan that'll run at at least 100 CFM. Bathrooms need 20 or 50 on an intermittent basis. HVI, the Home Ventilating Institute, the folks who actually make fans, range hoods, bathroom fans, and so on, would say actually we need a little more than that. We would recommend per linear foot. So if I have a 30 inch range, that's two and a half feet, it would need 250 CFM of ventilation. Over gas ranges, I need even more. I need 100 CFM, and in this case, I size it not on the linear feet. I design it based on the number of BTUs coming off the burners. If I have four burners at 10,000 BTUs each, I need 400 CFM off that range hood. And you're gonna say, wait a minute, I just made a tight house. How do I do that? Let's sign in for a different session later on. We'll talk about makeup air. Right now we're on air quality. We can talk makeup air later. And it's really just about imagining, you know, a properly ducted. I am going to say in a high performance house, I'm going to ask you to go back to, or at least think about, going back to fully ducted, at least partially ducted HRV or ERV systems. Pull from stale, stinky areas like bathrooms, 
the kitchens and so on, and then put the fresh air, and in this case it's showing the fresh air going back into the air handler return. Or actually consider putting the fresh air directly into bedrooms. What's really nice, inside this box, I want you to enhance the filtration. As the fresh air is coming in, this is the stale air going out, as the fresh air is coming in, I really would like you to enhance the filtration either on the furnace return putting in a better filter or right inside the box and there are now ERVs and HRVs in the market where you can buy even HEPA rated filters built into the box so the fresh air doesn't have that PM 2.5 coming in. It's hopefully you find it pretty powerful and so it's really elements, two elements. It's on the right hand side principal ventilation, whole house dilution, but don't discount and let's really understand the role of source control. Good quiet bathroom fan, good kitchen exhaust, properly sized, proper capture effectiveness um, to make sure that I've, I'm getting rid of those pollutants at the source. And I always use certified product, HVI certified product. The reason I say that is there is product coming from offshore these days that's not HVI certified. I saw four of them in a house the other day. All four of them, the minute I took the covers off the fans because the fans weren't working correctly, all the covers broke. It, it says to me, go to HVI North American. Well, they don't have to be North American made, but North American qualified fans, HVI certified is a good number. And when you're choosing a ventilation system, I mentioned to you, first, choose the right airflow. Second, choose HRV or ERV, and I'll talk about that in a second. Three, now des decide or define the proper duct configuration, how you want to run it, whether it's fully ducted or, or ducted uh, into the furnace return. And lastly, you know, pick a higher efficiency, the highest piece of efficiency you can, and of, of course, think about proper controls to get you there. And I'm going to say from almost everybody on this call, I couldn't see if anybody was from Alaska, you could use an HRV, but almost everybody else on this call should over time be switching to ERVs. ERVs on the right hand side do a little better job of reducing cooling loads in summertime and do a little bit better job of avoiding over drying in the wintertime. They're not dehumidifiers, I get that, they're not dehumidifiers but they're really good at reducing humidity loads in the summer and good at avoiding over drying in winter. Remember the ideal relative humidity, 40 to 60 percent? That's why you want to choose ERVs. They do have to be rated for cold climate, but choose ERVs. Uh, I think our last little topic and then perhaps we can hopefully add, well I'm probably close to being done, let's talk filtration. Remember it was fourth on the list of things to do, but it's so easy, it's so inexpensive, you really want to get to Indoor, uh, a, a better filtration. And at least MERV 10. MERV is minimum efficiency reporting value. It's a relatively new way of rating filters. It's a very useful way of rating filters. I'll show you here in a second. Understanding though that the better the filter, typically the more restrictive it is on airflow. So I have to be a little conscious of that. So you, I'm going to show you a recommendation on that. And so on the right hand side was asked about electronics. Electronics are fine. The new ones are way better than the old ones. The only issue with them is, well, two issues. They can't be MERV rated. They just don't, I'm not saying they're bad. They just don't get a MERV rating. And they do or could, when they're not clean, provide, uh, sorry, may emit small amounts of ozone, which we don't want. But I won't speak against them. They're fine. They do need, they're really good at fine particle removal. They just need to be cleaned really regularly, like four to six, four to eight weeks, something like that. So if you got a homeowner's not going to clean, don't give them electronic. Uh, the one in the middle is a one-inch filter, and there's various types, electrostatics, pleated, and so on. What I really want to move you towards is four-inch pleated, because I want you to get to over MERV 10. And the problem is, if you put in one-inch MERV 10, MERV 12, you got to change them every three or four weeks. I literally was at a gentleman's house under a Tarion investigation, basement's cold in the winter time and it's the filter's not his only problem but he said I change it religiously once a month and this filter was already it's very good filter by the way one of the top brand names the problem is it's such a good filter he's got a bit of a dusty household kids dogs pets so on and this filter was already three times the static pressure that the furnace was rated to the furnace was rated to 0.4 inches of static pressure this one was already one point, you won't necessarily know what I'm speaking of here, but tune in on another session. 1.2 inch of the static pressure. Very, very resistant filter. So I'm going to encourage you, 
All you need to do is provide a four inch wide filter slot. This can't cost more than a hundred bucks, please. Maybe 150 an HVAC guy may tell me, put in a filter rack that can get you a four inch wide so your customers can ensure adequate airflow that will reduce the need to filter, to, redu to change their filters and would enable you to get to 10 to 12 MRF. So please put in a four inch filter slot from this day forward. You're asking me questions, you're on this session because you wanted to know what could I do to make high performance houses. Filtration is easy to do. Put in a four inch filter slot. Here's why, here's the MERV ratings. I'll, I'll show you this one. Um, on the left hand side is the MERV rating. In the middle here, you'll notice, remember 2.5? That's that range two. And I'll just blow this up for you so you'll see it on the next slide. Range two is if you want to see any amount of significant removal of fine dust particles, notice at MERV 10, you're at 50% fine dust particle removal. That's where you want to start. MERV 10 to MERV 12 gets you to 50 to 80 percent. So that's why I'm saying MERV 12 because fine dust particles are of interest to your clients. And especially if when you're bringing in fresh air from outside through an ERV, HRV, whatever, we absolutely would like that, that air to pass through a MERV 10 to MERV 12, either in the HRV or ERV itself or in the furnace return. And frankly, put it in the furnace return because you can put a bigger filter in, a wider filter, won't have to change it as often, and it will filter air in the house at the same time. So that's where you'd like to get to. And if you wanna go further, HEPA filters, by all means. Remember that Oasis, that SEAL strategy? By all means, do a critical room, the child with the asthma. There's great new filters out there. I used to speak against these 30 years ago, and now I would say they're quiet enough, they're convenient enough, they actually work. So as long as it's a half decent one, you're gonna say, what do I know half decent? There's been consumer reports done on these that'll outline them. Look for a clean air delivery rate, a clean air delivery rate of at least 100 CFM. Write it down, C-A-D-R of 100. That means it's cleaning 100%, 100 CFM, clean air, 100 CFM per minute for a room. On the right hand side, you can install it for a whole house. The problem is it needs its own fan system. So it's a fan in a box with a HEPA filter in it. And they're relatively expensive and, um, and, and, and actually take a fair bit of power consumption. So if you're thinking HEPA, maybe it's a portable room filter for somebody who's uh, sensitive is what we want to get to. And then our last little piece is humidity. We want to stay between 40 and 60% is where we'd like to be, which means in summertime, in Southern Ontario for sure, we need dehumidification strategies. And you have four strategies at the top. ERVs help, by all means switch to those, or and or two-stage air conditioners, or portable dehumidifiers, or I'm gonna move you towards whole house dehumidifiers. You're high performance builders, let's put in a whole house dehumidifier. It's down on the bottom right, it installs in the basement, typically it's installed into the duct system and it dehumidifies the air at about five times the efficiency of a standard portable dehumidifier. And now they don't have to worry about uh, emptying it. Now they don't have to worry about tripping over it and the noise of it. Put it in the mechanical room. Whole house dehumidification it has to be on your list of things to do. There it is there, and it's because things have changed a little bit. More time indoors, higher moisture loads, we need to think about whole house dehumidification. I said I was gonna talk makeup air. I don't have time, we'll talk about it later. I'm gonna to say to you, go have a look, look it up. Indoor, EPA's Indoor Air Plus program. You know EPA started the Energy Star program and we brought it to Canada in 2005. What about their Indoor Air Plus program? It's a complimentary label. When you do Energy Star, if you'd like, you, as a complimentary label, you can do Indoor Air Plus. And it's a checklist, it's a one page checklist. It includes all the items you see on the left. Moisture control, HVAC, filtration, ventilation, combustion safety, so on and so on, including radon control. And it's a simple label. It's been looked at in Canada. I'm not sure we're gonna bring it to Canada, but you do need to be aware in the DOE's um, energy, uh, sorry, net, uh, zero energy program, Indoor Air Plus is a requirement. So Energy Star is an option. Um, it, and by all means do indoor air plus with it. But if you get to their zero energy program, you actually have to do indoor air as well, indoor air plus program. And CHBA actually in their net zero energy program, I was talking to Brent uh, this, mor Brett this morning from CHBA, 
And he said, yes, we're getting close to publishing, or at least uh, sending out for public review, the uh, checklist of indoor air quality for the net zero program. So kind of interesting. So just to summarize, it's about remove, it's about seal or isolate, it's about ventilation, and it's about filtration. And when we say remove, we're saying remove the chance of water. When we say seal, we're talking about sealing the house to garage connection. We're talking about sealing the water out from the house, the fully, uh, fully developed uh, flashed uh, house wrap system. And we're talking about ventilation systems. When we talk remove, we're talking about low VOC paints, which you're already doing, but how about low VOC cabinetry, low VOC adhesives, choosing products that don't smell. Looking for those strategies is what we want to get to. Uh, there are some great resources of this on the right-hand side. We'll send you a link to uh, CMHC's information on proper indoor air quality. And just in summary, as I'll finish this up, and we'll have a few minutes for questions. It's a bigger issue than ever before, and your homeowners are looking for answers more so than ever because their house is now their office, their school. They want indoor air quality solutions. And it's remove, seal, ventilate, filter. Radon's got to be on your list. Got to track it. Make sure you have the capacity for continuous ventilation. Start moving towards, transitioning towards ERVs is a better choice. Choose a 4-inch filter slot. MERV 10 to MERV 13 is where you'd like to be. Choose low off-gassing materials, please. And take a systemized approach to optimize costs. And what you're going to find is it's the same things you do to make a house energy efficient, tight, so on, also improves air quality. Very important to understand. The same, exact same things you do for indoor air quality, sorry, for uh, energy efficiency, also improve the air quality in houses. So uh, thanks for attending. And I know there's questions or items in the chat, but uh, Stacy, let's go for it. Okay, we've got about seven. We'll see how quickly you can get through them before we uh, end the session for today uh, for everyone. Yep. Uh, Michael wants to know, what's your view on condensing clothes dryers not vented to exterior? It's a really good question. I've tried them. From an air quality perspective, you'd want to be really careful about uh, the uh, uh, chemicals that you used in your clothes washing. So you'd want to use really, uh, I'll call environmental friendly or health friendly um, uh, um, chemicals and so on for cleaning, soaps and so on. The moisture that they give off is a little bit problematic, but I'm not too bad. I, I, from a, I, I don't think they're terrible from an indoor air quality perspective, as long as we had ventilation in and around the closet that they were in. Okay. Um, HVAC wanted to vent bathrooms out from the soffit, uh, showed the guy videos of the attic mold where moist air went back into attic condensed on the sheathing and created mold. So you had the bathroom vented into an ERV system. Would you consider that a correct choice? Uh, the, the short answer is no. Um, you do not want, I don't mind the bathroom being exhausted by the ERV or HRV. You just, we've done this years ago, put in a bathroom fan and vent it into. It's frankly a complete waste of time. It doesn't boost the flow at all. The fan's basically there doing nothing. It's amp draw, whatever. It doesn't increase the flow through the HRV from the bathroom. And in fact, kind of gets in the way when the fan's not on. It's adding cost and complexity that you don't need. So put a properly sized vent from the ERV into the bathroom. There are now zone controls. It's called uh, Posh Whisper Grills. A zone control that will actually move that grill open more when you call from that bathroom, but don't put in the bathroom fan. Now, the bathroom fan vented into the soffit. There are approved soffit vents that would allow you to put it. You just don't want to dump it into the soffit, but through a, and a Panasonic has, it's called, I think it's called Easy Vent, and it, it does a really nice job of making sure that the air doesn't, uh, that the air gets properly exhausted through the soffit to the outside, and then just don't put in perforations three feet either side. So if you're going to do bathroom fan into the vented into a soffit make sure that the vented soffit or the venting of the soffit is blanked off for the first uh, three feet either side of that fan okay um for good temperature and humidity control is it better to use programmable thermostats or a set point for winter summer and then leave it alone we always get this, you know, is setback make sense? From an air quality perspective, I'm going to put it this way. Um, if you set back your thermostat at night, let's say 65 degrees, I'll say uh, 18, 17 degrees Celsius, 
when you lower the temperature, you actually raise the relative humidity. Hmm. So as I lower my temperature, I get more condensation on my windows and the relative humidity is higher than I perhaps want it to be. I don't mind setbacks. I actually think setbacks are fine. In high performance houses, you'll find the value of setbacks is actually smaller. Why? Because think of as an airplane. When an airplane takes off, it immediately goes up to 30,000 feet. And you go, wow, that's taking a lot of energy to get to 30,000 feet. But then it cruises at 30,000 feet for the next 200 miles, and then it saves energy as it makes its descent back down. It saves money up here because there's less resistance in airflow. That's why they go up there is to get to, get to lower air pressure, air density, so they save on fuel. The similarly is true with furnaces. As I turn the heat off, I save energy. As I turn the heat back on, I lose that energy. It's the amount of time that you spend down at that lower temperature where you save energy. And if you have a high performance house, which loses energy very, very slowly, and by the time the night is over, now it's gonna gain back up, you didn't spend any time at that temperature, so you really didn't save any money. You, you saved here, you lost here. So it only works if you have extended periods of time where you're at that lower temperature. So setbacks have less importance in high performance houses. They don't have a lot of impact on indoor air quality other than relative humidity. In the summer, when you raise your thermostat and keep it warmer in the house, that is really nice. If uh, People ask me all the time, what should I do if I have a house in Florida? I'm not there in the summer. Should I run my air conditioner? And the answer is actually, you wanna turn the thermostat up so the air conditioner doesn't come on until it gets to about 78, because I'm thinking Florida, 78, what's that? 27 degrees, something like that. But then do have it come on on a dehumidification cycle. So as you raise the thermostat, the, dehumid the humidification, sorry, the humidity level went down, so that's a good thing. But every now and again, it's gotta run on a dehumidification cycle to take out some of the moisture. That's a long answer to a relatively short question to an even more complicated question, but I'll, I'll try to do this. Generally speaking, thermostat, changing thermostat temperatures you're, in high performance houses, you're getting to the point where it's leave it and forget it unless you're away for extended periods of time. Okay. Um, what is your opinion on the new Zener system or CERVs from the Green Building Institute? Yeah, so um, the, there's, there's ERVs and HRVs coming from, uh, from Europe. In fact, there's one, a heat pump based version out of Quebec, highly efficient. The problem I have, frankly, with, with that equipment is it's not rated, most of them are not rated for Canada. Canada has very specific requirements that they have to meet in terms of cold weather performance. And uh, Germany is much warmer than Canada. The coldest city in Germany listed in ASHRAE is about as cold as Windsor, Ontario. So a unit that works in Windsor wouldn't necessarily work in Edmonton. So if you're going to choose that equipment, choose a piece of equipment that's HVI rated. Go to HVI.org and look and see if that piece of equipment is indeed qualified because the National Building Code says got to be tested at minus 25. Ontario Building Code says got to be tested at minus 25. So if it's not, then don't buy it. Otherwise, they are very, they're a very nice piece of equipment, wonderful piece of equipment, considerably more expensive than North American-made equipment. And of course, you had to bring them across on a boat or a plane. So I would say buy American-Canadian-made equipment. Most of them are made in Canada, so buy Canadian-made equipment. You'll find that they're better suited for Canada, and you can find them at very, well, the same performance levels there, uh, as German-based equipment. OK. Um, do you have time for a few more questions, Gore? I do. Uh, yeah. It's security. Some may have to leave. but Okay. All right. Um, do you recommend steam humidifiers on furnace for wintertime? I, I do believe in humidity adding the ability to add moisture because the healthy range is 35 to, sorry, 35 plus or minus 5. And you're, if you're getting too low, I want the capacity. I don't mind steam. They have to be properly maintained. So, you know, in today's world, hire a mechanical contractor to come in and service your steam humidifier at the same time they service your furnace. Uh, understand that. There's n absolutely, I love steam humidifiers, great choice, especially in large houses. Uh, but there are other types of humidification as well. Okay. Um, is there a construction instruction for installing retrofit windows, brick exterior, siding exterior? Oh, great question. And, and his question is construction instruction is the my partners in the US who draw these great animations. We do not have an animation of installing a window in a retrofit, but I've just made a note of it 
I'll, we'll try to get that one done. We'll try Wonderful. to get well, that, Thank you very much for that question. I'll try to get that done. Okay. Uh, can whole house dehumidifier uh, be installed retrofit? Absolutely. Okay. It's actually a pretty simple install. There's no hole to the outside. It's you're dumping it. Typically you're, well, typically you're pulling out of the basement, dumping it into the supply. Keep this in mind. You're dumping it into the supply of the furnace and there's nothing wrong with that. It works really well. Needs a damper, but yes, you absolutely can. Okay. And last question, what's the best practice for commissioning fresh air systems? Best practice for commissioning fresh air. Well, wow, great question. The good news is the leading HRVs and ERVs, the Canadian made products all have now either self, not self balancing, but the ability to check their own airflow. Um, so you can see right on the screen what the airflow is out of each fan. And that makes it really easy to commission those. But here's, uh, you would say the process, you go into the house, first of all, you check the hoods outside to make sure the fresh air is coming from a place that's actually going to be fresh air and make sure those hoods are clean. Then you go inside, open the unit up, make sure the filters are clean and check as your house, Stacy, make sure the ducts are actually in the right location because <laughs> I've seen it many times. So check to make sure the fresh air is actually coming through the fresh air port and so on. Clean the filters, close the unit back up and measure the flow at high speed. You measure the flow at high speed and make sure it's balanced at high speed. This, it, there's some debate over this, but ba balanced at high speed. Balanced airflow, fresh air, exhaust air within 10% of each other. Doesn't have to be perfect, within 10% of each other. Th balance it at that and then check the flow at low speed. That is, am I getting the right amount of air? Remember four bedroom house needs 75? Am I getting 75 CFM of air? That, that would be the balancing procedure. And then you're gonna say, should the furnace fan be on or off? I would check it with both. Check the, with the furnace fan on and off if you're ducted into the furnace return to make sure you've got proper flow. Okay, that's all the questions we have. And I think we wrapped it up in, in pretty good time there, Gord. Thank that's you three so minutes much. late. I'm usually <laughs> much later than that. <laughs> that's awesome. And so again, everyone, this is recorded. We have all the information. We're going to add a few links into our resource email that will go out after this presentation. Gord's just going to clean up the Q&A part here uh, for the ones that came from the chat side because they don't come over into the, the Q&A recording part. So we'll get that sent out to you uh, in a day or two. And again, I'm Stacy Cooper, and this is Gord Cook, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, Gord. Thank you.